Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. Just to get the obvious out of the way, why am I wearing a sling? I broke my collarbone mountain biking. It was painful and uh, I, I need the sling to not be in pain. Also, I couldn't change into a shirt because I didn't want to take the sling off. Anyway, let's get into it. The Yak 41, but not quite yet because this video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their awesome all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More more on them in just a bit. Our story today begins on a sunny July day, much like the day I crashed my mouth. <laughs> it's on my mind, it's very painful, and there's now a big metal plate in there. I'm on my way to becoming my own mega project, a cyborg. The year is 1960 and the location is a small town called Farnborough, England, the home of an internationally renowned air show and the site of the world's first public demonstrations of the West's newest stride in the field of aviation, a fully functional VTOL jet called the Short SC-1, which at the time was serving as a proof of concept for the soon to follow Hawker Harrier jump jet. On this day, a large crowd of spectators is watching, astounded by its apparent ability to take off like a helicopter and fly like a jet. Of all the people present in the crowd that day, the last person you might expect to see would be a high-ranking Soviet official. Well, not if he was a spy. <laughs> However, that is precisely where Mr. Alexander Sergeyevich Yakolev found himself on that very July morning, watching with the rest of the crowd this astonishing feat of engineering. As the founder of the Yakolev Design Bureau, this spectacle must have meant something significantly different to him than the other spectators around him. After all, he was a Soviet citizen, and this was the height of the Cold War. He was fully aware of the military applications of such an aircraft, and to him it could represent just another step closer to, well, utter destruction. On the other hand, he was an engineer, and where some Soviet leaders saw a threat, he saw a challenge and a significant development in his own field. Whether this moment inspired fear or simply inspired him, Oh, we just don't know. What we do know is that it would drive Yakolev for the next two decades in his attempts to develop a Soviet VTOL jet, and though he didn't know it, he would end up creating a design that would serve the Americans better than it ever served the Soviets. Upon returning to the Soviet Union, Yakolev would immediately set about designing his new Soviet version of this jet. Though the Soviets were aware of the West's VTOL program, they showed little enthusiasm for creating a comparable jet of their own. However, Yakolev went ahead with his development, and only a year later would end up convincing the Soviet leadership of the serious potential that would come with a fleet of VTOL-capable jets. This led to them issuing the Yakolev Design Bureau with a directive to produce a single-seat fighter bomber jet. They gave it the provisional in designation of Yak V, and that V doesn't mean five, it's short for, oh god, something in Russian. <laughs> Vertikaini? I guess that makes sense. Vertical, maybe. I don't know. Russian very well. <laughs> I even see there's the Russian with the Cyrillic alphabet in the script in front of me, which, uh, is not helpful at all. <laughs> and I have a note from the writer telling me they just did it to torture me. <laughs> Why? Anyway, this new directive stipulated the following requirements. The jet could be no heavier than 9,150 kilograms, capable of supersonic flight, able to carry a payload of 500 kilograms, and capable of vertical takeoff and landing. I feel like that last one's a bit of a given, isn't it? This was no small task for even someone like Yakolev, who had taken a natural interest in VTOL flight long before the project had ever begun. This job was made all the more difficult owing to the Soviet Union's distinct lack of any engines capable of thrust vectoring, which simply means having engines that could point both downwards and also horizontally, nor the power delivery needed for vertical takeoff and landing, because, well, you need a lot of power. If you recall from the first video of this series, and if you're unaware of this series, we've done a whole series of videos on different VTOL aircraft, so go check those out if you want to, no pressure. The development of the Hawker Harrier could only begin once a jet engine powerful and capable enough to produce the necessary thrust was developed. This was the Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine. But as the old saying goes, is necessity. 
Liberty is the mother of all invention, and when you live in the USSR, you had better believe that you're gonna make your government-issued directives lest you end up in the gulag. <laughs> no pressure! And so, in that spirit, the spirit of the gulag, Mr. Yakolev came up with the tadpole configuration of engines. Simply put, this was two R27 300s to Mansky engines set side by side with two adjustable nozzles attached to the exhaust. These engines would be placed on the forward portion of the jet so as to ensure that when the engines were in their downward position, any thrust produced would be directed along the jet's center mass. And so you might now be asking, well, why is this called a tadpole configuration? We have no idea, and we couldn't figure it out. This was about as simple a solution as you could get, and it came with its caveats, one of which was a serious lack of stability. To understand why this is, we'll actually use the Harrier jump jet as a comparison. First off, the center of mass is a theoretical point within an object that simply notes the point at which an object can balance without tipping or tilting and less acted upon. With regard to our current topic, consider the Harrier, which had four separate exhaust nozzles, two in front of the vehicle center of mass and two behind it. Now, this provides a much larger platform on which to rest. Compared to the Yak-36, which had only two supports, both which rested directly on the center of mass, it meant any small fluctuations, like just a gust of wind, could greatly destabilize the whole system. A good way to visualize this is to get something like a ruler and hold it out in front of you with one finger supporting each end. Now, I originally wanted to demonstrate this when I went through the script before. <laughs> But now I can't even do it because the, 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 the hand. The hand. Okay, so imagine this represents the Harrier. Now try and hold the ruler with just one finger and you'll see how difficult it would be to control a jet. The solution to this instability problem was to use something very similar to what we've already seen on the Harrier jet. And this was to set a reaction valve on both wings and the tail and the nose of the jet and use this as a means to control and direct the jet while in vertical flight. However, with the jet engines being so far forward, the engineers had to rely on a bit of mechanical advantage to ensure that the valve on the nose was strong enough. And you'll see what I mean about about that if you don't understand it in just a moment. After only two years of development, the Yakolev Design Bureau released something resembling a finished product in the form of the Yak-36. Unfortunately, this jet would meet a premature end during the testing phases and ultimately only four jets were ever produced. The final product of this development process was a pretty strange looking vehicle with two enormous circular air intakes beneath the body and a conspicuous pipe protruding from the nose. And that is what we meant by mechanical advantage. It also came with a particularly unusual feature due to the instability of the vehicle when in vertical flight and the uncertainty as to whether or not it would be able to consistently transition from one flight mode to another, the engineers made the decision to incorporate a proprietary automatic ejection system into the jet. If the jet's onboard system detected a sharp change in pitch during VTOL mode, the automatic ejection sequence would be activated in which the pilot's hands would be yanked from the throttle and steer could forcibly restrained, after which the jet would automatically eject the pilot regardless of whether they wanted it or not, which sounds absolutely terrifying. After several months of testing and two significant crashes, the program for this jet was cancelled. However, this was not the end of the line for Yakolev or his jets, as we'll soon find out. But before we find out about all of that, oh yes, it's time for you guys to hear about today's excellent sponsor, Squarespace. You know what's great about summer? Vacation, time off, crashing mountain bikes. It's a perfect time to spend lying on the beach or in the park or crashing mountain bikes daydreaming about the next project that you want to start. Fortunately, Squarespace gives you every possible tool that you might want to make your dreams a reality. Whether it's a small business, a sports blog, a creative portfolio, did I say sports bog? A sports blog, a creative portfolio, or just a page full of the dankest of memes, it does not matter. If you can dream it, you can build it with Squarespace. So are you looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Bam! Use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you like it's right out of the box. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person, you've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all the customization options that you could ever want, with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides that your website can thrive 
email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24 7 customer support, everything you could ever need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, do it with Squarespace. Right now, just go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash mega projects to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back into it. With the program meeting a premature end, it would be easy to think that the jet had been a complete failure for Yakolev. However, the Soviet Navy, who had originally resisted the idea of a VTOL jet, were impressed by the Yak-36 for some reason, and now saw it as a potentially feasible concept given another round of development. And so, on the 27th of September 1967, the Yakolev Design Bureau was given a second directive to develop a new VTOL aircraft, but this time it would be a solely attack aircraft. Now, with a bit more time available for development, Yakolev could devote more time and thought to the mechanism upon which this new jet operated. At first, development focused on perfecting the Dadpole design. However, after much discussion, it was eventually decided to use a different power plant configuration, electing this time to go for a mixed power plant design. What that means is that instead of having two engines with variable thrust vectoring, as we've seen in the likes of the Harrier and the original Yak-36, they would have a set of secondary engines installed specifically for Four vertical lifts and one large primary engine at the back. This would have a variable thrust vector. These secondary engines would be detached from the rest of the system in regular flight and would only become activated when carrying out a VTOL maneuver. Now, that might seem a little familiar to those of you who have already seen our previous video on the F 35 Lightning, which, if you haven't, I would suggest you give it a watch because it's an amazing video containing possibly some of the best writing available on YouTube. <laughs> Angus, the writer on this script, is. Give me a raise, Simon. The best writing on YouTube. Anyway, yeah, that single engine configuration had a large resemblance to a certain US jet, but we'll get to that just a bit later. For now, development was going ahead on this new configuration, and by the early 1970s, the first prototypes were in production, with the first completed test flight being carried out in 1971. After several more years of testing and tweaking, the final designation, Yak-38, was applied, and the jet went into production. Seeing this new jet, it's difficult not to notice the similarities it shares with the Harrier. However, those were really only skin deep. In fact, the previous generation, the Yak-36, shared far more in common with the Harrier with regard to engine design and operation. This new jet may have looked similar to the Harrier, but its engine operations were in some ways many decades ahead of the Harrier, and in other ways were many decades behind. But more on that later. Suffice it to say, this jet was capable of supersonic flight, a feat the Harrier was originally supposed to accomplish but never did. This jet was also far more dangerous than the Harrier. Dangerous to the pilot, that is. There was a reason in the British elected against using the mixed power plant design. The issue was that on a fundamental level, jet aerodynamics do not suit three-dimensional travel. In other words, you can travel efficiently in one direction or the other, but just not both. The best way to understand this is to think about an engineer designing a conventional jet. They will know what direction the air will be coming from, and they'll make that jet as aerodynamic as possible in that one direction. That process unavoidably makes the aerodynamics in every other direction just a bit shite. Think about looking at a jet from nose point on and then the top-down point of view. It's two very different silhouettes. In a conventional jet, never an issue, but in VTOL, well, you start to see the problem. Now, pretty much all vertical maneuvers don't need to be made at speed, so the efficiency is not the issue. The real issue is that the jet, which needs to be very narrow in order to reduce resistance in forward flight, does not provide a lot of space for installing a jet engine that would be pointed at the ground. Any engine that you could fit in that area would have to be tiny and would produce a minuscule amount of thrust relative to the amount needed to lift the jet off the ground. The Harrier avoided this issue with the use of one huge engine with adjustable nozzles. That way, it could take advantage of the lateral space available to it. Only now are we even coming close to the kind of technology that would allow a powerful enough jet to be packed into that small of a space. And Soviet Russia back in the 1970s, well, let's just say they didn't have the technology 50 years ahead of time. Not even close. The solution, it seemed, was to use two jet engines for lift and make the main jet engine able to adjust its angle to assist with the remainder of the lift. The engine gimbal feature would be no small feat either and would require a very precise and complex bit of engineering, but it was achievable and they did achieve it. However, even though they now had the main engine adding to the lift, those smaller engines would still have to be pushed to their absolute limit to just meet the basic lift requirements. So, 
Tying this whole giant tangent back together, those overstrained engines had an unfortunate habit of simply cutting out when under significant stress. So it just so happens that these moments of significant stress also occurred at times when you needed the engines to work most, like when you were coming into a landing at a faster speed than usual. Owing to the fact that this would be happening at high speed, these accidents would occur too fast for the pilot to react. Thankfully, Mr. Yakolev had a solution to that. Remember that trusty automatic ejection system? <laughs> which sounded absolutely terrifying. Well, after several years of development, they weren't as temperamental as they had been in earlier models, and they were put to better use. Now, you might be surprised to hear that that wasn't even the biggest issue with this jet. That prize goes to its inability to perform in certain weather conditions. It's a simple fact of jet engine design that cooler air increases engine efficiency and warmer air decreases it. As with most jet engines, the goal is to push that threshold up as high as possible to make the engines as efficient as possible in in all conditions. However, with those overworked lift engines, there wasn't really much room to improve the efficiency. In fact, that threshold was so low that during the summer months, the jet would frequently be incapable of carrying out a vertical takeoff unless completely stripped of its weaponry, and when the Soviets went to war in Afghanistan, the jet was completely incapable of taking off at all. Not brilliant. Despite this, the Soviet Navy ordered a total of 200 of these jets during the entire production run of the aircraft, and throughout this time, the jet served its purpose as long as the sun wasn't out. In one of the most memorable incidents regarding the Yak-38, a pilot was carrying out a routine vertical takeoff when the jet malfunctioned and automatically ejected the pilot. There was, however, nothing wrong with the jet, and it simply continued to rise without the presence of the pilot, and eventually crashed into a farm building. It's unclear if anyone was killed in the crash, but this being Soviet Russia, we could be pretty certain that if the owner did survive, they were probably sent to the Gulag for building their farm building in way of a government crash site, or perhaps just breathing too loudly. Despite these minor issues, the jet was kept in regular use by the Navy for 15 years, and seemingly happy with the jet's performance, they put in another request for the yak Design Bureau to create a second, more modern version of the Yak-38. Shortly after the request was accepted, however, Alexander Yakolev died in 1989, never seeing the end of this final development. But the show must go on. As they say, by 1991, this new jet, given the designation of Yak-41, was nearing completion. They had done away with the large ovular air intakes, and opted instead for the classic square intake, similar to that of the Russian MiGs. Everything seemed to be going very smoothly, and they were almost ready to begin testing when a small hiccup occurred in the form of the Soviet Union collapsing. Overnight, all demands for weapons manufacturing and development disappeared, and, well, that was the end of the Russian VTOL program. But it wasn't the end of the Yak-41. All right, so you know that old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friends? Well, that has absolutely nothing to do with this. However, we are going to explain all of those hints about the Americans finding a use for the Yak-41. Because once the Iron Curtain fell on the 26th of December 1991, a certain US-based jet manufacturer got word of a certain Russia-based design bureau that just so happened to have a great deal of research and knowledge on a certain VTOL jet engine configuration. It also just so happens that this Russian company recently lost their entire revenue stream and was trying to find a way to just not go bankrupt. We are, of course, talking about Lockheed Martin, specifically a small development team in the world-renowned Lockheed Skunk Works, who were working on a jet called the X-35, which if you saw our previous video, would later become the F-35 Lightning, America's flagship jet. In a deal of around 300 to 400 million dollars, the Yakolev Design Bureau agreed to provide Lockheed Martin with three jets and vital research in the design and operation of that kind of engine layout. The Yak-41 was just another evolution of the previous Yak-38, better tunes with more efficient and, most importantly, more reliable lift engines. This new iteration also had a radar our system, which was a feature the previous generation lacked, and most significant of all, its design criteria had been altered. Originally an attack aircraft, the jet had become solely focused on air superiority and defending the Soviet naval fleet. We don't really know how well the Yak-41 actually fulfilled these requirements, and it didn't really matter, because that was not what Lockheed Martin was interested in. No, Lockheed Martin was interested in how the yak Design Bureau had managed to engineer their lift fan and vectoring engine configuration. And you can see just how much of an influence this jet had 
on the F-35 of today, with that weird moving engine exhaust being one of the jet's most recognizable features. Depending on how you look at it, this jet was either a partial success or a complete failure. It was inefficient, it was unsafe, and it was incapable of even taking off in certain conditions like sunny weather. However, despite all of that, it was still the first jet capable of surpassing the speed of sound and then carrying out a vertical landing all in the same journey, no small feat. And whether Yakolev would like it or not, his jet engine design would become a crucial mechanism in America's premier military jet. It's difficult to know whether Yakolev would have been happy with the fate of his life's work. He undoubtedly had a love for engineering and development of jet aircraft in general, but he was also a Soviet citizen and a profiteer of the Cold War. Over his many years of service, he distinguished himself and he was the recipient of a great many awards from the Soviet states, so he was clearly at the very least supportive of the Soviet regime. When you look at it like that, it's pretty easy to conclude that Yakolev would not have been happy with his life's work in the hands of his enemies. However, that's maybe not looking at the whole picture. Consider this. Would you say that the Yak-36 was a success or a failure? Perhaps it was a failure. It certainly lacked in some crucial aspects like safety and simple operational effectiveness, but perhaps it was a success, not in the ways that would matter to military personnel, but would matter to someone who took value in advancements in engineering, such as Yakolev. Few jets from that era still have their technology in the machines of today, let alone being a fundamental part of the most advanced jet of our time. In the same way, concluding that Yakolev would have been unhappy with the fate of his work perhaps does not take the whole situation into account and overlooks one of his most significant traits, that being the fact that above all else, he did not want the world to end in a nuclear holocaust. Despite how the media might depict the Soviet Union and its inhabitants, they were just as opposed to nuclear war as any average Western citizen. From this, we could conclude that Yakolev would be glad that the world of the future is not a barren nuclear wasteland, a fact that I think, well, we can all be pretty pleased about. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Please do also check out our fantastic sponsor Squarespace, their link to below. And thank you for watching.